Well, probably we'll have a couple of people coming in um, slightly late, but um, I think we might as well uh, get started now. So um, thank you all very much for, for coming to this, this talk, which is the first of our new series of lectures in collaboration with the Anglo-Russian Research Network, which um, has been uh, a collaborator of ours in the past, and we're very pleased to be reviving the um, partnership um it's it's been i think quite uh, dormant for a while but is now up and running again and looking for submissions for for um for seminars so uh, do get in touch the details um are on our event pages um and today we're very pleased to be welcoming uh, miran maguire to talk about the first um first translator of Russian poetry in English. Um, John Bowring or, or Bowring, we're, we're not quite sure of the pronunciation yet, but I'll, I'll let you um, probably, Miran, decide on that. Um, and Miran actually lives quite near to where John was uh, from in Exeter, which is a very kind of pleasing symmetry. Um, so um, without much further ado, I will. Um, Hand you over to uh, Dr. Miriam Maguire. Hey, uh, good evening, everyone. Can you all hear me okay? Uh, in a couple of moments, I'm going to share my screen so that you can see the lovely PowerPoint that I've prepared, hopefully without any technical disasters. But first of all, I want to begin by thanking um, Pushkin House and, of course, the Anglo Russian Research Network for making tonight's talk possible and also the next five seminars that will be taking place between now and I think December 11th. So, um, and for me, I never managed to get to London to see all the wonderful seminars that used to be on at Pushkin House. So it's um, an honor to be invited to give one and a real pleasure to be able to attend. Um, I can now see that we can we can solve the question, um, Rafi, that's been torturing us, the great boring, bowering debate. I had heard both, but I think that um, the holder of that surname has now joined us. So, um, Bill, would you like to unmute yourself and tell us how to pronounce your surname? Yeah, it's bowering. <clears throat> and it's, so it's bow as in bow down, and it's not bow as in bow and arrow. And people always want to stick an E in the middle of it um, to make it bowering. But anyway, bowering it is. And it's an ancient Saxon name, meaning a very humble servant who lives in a shack. So it's a link to the word bower, you know, as in a kind of a leafy bower. I see. I see. Thank you very much indeed, Bill. So I'm glad you've cleared up that question and that bowering um, is, is correct. And um, okay, um, that's that's splendid. Okay, please um, bear with me while I try to um, remember how to share my screen. Uh, okay, splendid. I hope everyone can see that, and. Um, I would like to begin by sharing with you a rather nice quotation from, um, from one of the introductions to the many books of translated poetry, which Sir John Bowring published in his lifetime. And um, I'm going to read the whole thing out because it's, um, it's a really nice vision of what the translator's task should be. It also explains the title of my talk tonight, The Ark of the Translator. So John Bowring wrote in 1830, in his introduction to a collection of Hungarian poems, there are some who look upon the occupations of a translator as ignoble and unworthy of literary ambition. I am well content to stand at a respectful distance from those great intellects whose works are born on the wings of an all pervading fame to every country where the ear of civilization is listening. Yet I cannot believe that my humble labors are useless, nor have I ever wanted, 
and I hope I never shall want, while health is vouchsafed to me, both encouragement and enthusiasm to pursue them. My mission at all events is one of benevolence. I have never left the ark of my country, but with the wish to return to it, bearing fresh olive branches of peace and fresh garlands of poetry. Um, I never yet visited the land where I found not much to love, to learn, to imitate, to honor. I never yet saw a man utterly despoiled of his humanities. In Europe, at least, there are no moral nor intellectual wildernesses. Let others go forth with me to gather its fruit and flowers. I think that's a lovely and really inspiring passage. And um, it was certainly a remarkable manifesto for translation as a means for cultural transmission and indeed international harmony. It came from the experienced pen of a lifelong Unitarian, a dedicated economic liberal and a convinced humanitarian. John Bowring was all of these things, but who was John Bowring? In tonight's talk, I want to focus on a single aspect of John Bowring's truly multifarious cultural activities, namely his connection with Russia, and specifically his role as the first translator of Russian poetry into English. And so I'll begin by explaining who Bowring was for those of you in the audience who may not be familiar with him or related to him. And, um, and then of course, how he emerged as such a prolific translator. Uh, then I'll discuss his visit to Russia and uh, the circumstances surrounding his publication of uh, two volumes of Russian poetry anthologies. And um, I will conclude by assessing quite briefly uh, the quality of his translations. And so I should have a slide here, which gives you an overview of his, of his life and his major achievements. You can see, first of all, that he was quite, um, quite long, impressively long lived. Um, but he was born on the 17th of October, 1792. And um, he belonged to a long established family of Devonshire wool merchants. And I've given you the original spelling of the family name, which comes to us um, from Norman on possibly indeed Saxon times. And you can see it was originally spelled boring. So John was one of nine children of whom only three survived to adulthood as was quite normal at the beginning of the 19th century. His, his father, Charles, rented a house called Little Lock Bear um, from the wealthier wool merchants across the street of, of whom I'll say a little more later when I come to that slide. Um, his mother, Sarah, was a vicar's daughter from the Dartmoor town of Morton Hampstead. So a very solid Devonshire family. On his father's side, that family was very firmly Unitarian and they were regular attendees at the local Unitarian chapel, George's Meeting House, just outside the south gate of Exeter City and a really short walk from the Bowring household. Now, T.S. Eliot, who wasn't much of a fan, uh, once called Unitarianism, and I quote, periodic assemblage, assemblages of well-intentioned people of similar social background. However, Unitarianism meant a lot more than that to Bowring. He took, it, it, he took his faith very seriously. He planned as a young man to become a Unitarian minister, although he never affected this. And then um, he remained in the movement all his life. And as we shall see, it led to at least one of his most significant connections. His religious faith was a significant personal commitment because it wasn't until the repeal of um, repressive laws in 1828 and in practice until five to ten years later uh, was it legal or really possible for a, a, a person who was a religious dissenter to hold public office. And um, because all of um, Bowring's commercial enterprises failed when he was still quite a young man, he relied on government patronage to make his career. Uh, even though his faith could have seriously retarded his advancement in the world, then um, Bowring stuck to his Unitarian principles while pursuing what amounted to two simultaneous careers. So after working in the family firm for a while and then being apprenticed to a different merchant in Exeter, 
In 1810, at the age of 18, uh, Bowring took himself to London and started working for the firm of Milford and Company. Eight years later, he set up his very own merchant business with a partner, selling British herrings to France and Spain and importing French wine. Ever since his early boyhood, Bowring had learned foreign languages from native speakers wherever they could be found and from books when they could not. Um, it is scarcely more difficult to learn five languages than one, he wrote in his memoirs afterwards, rather exasperatingly for any of us who have ever struggled to learn um, a second language, let alone a third. Um, now that Bowring was an independent commercial traveller with his own firm, he was travelling regularly to Europe and um, particularly to Spain. And very naturally for him, he began translating and reviewing Spanish poetry. And um, he published a couple of articles and then a book completely dedicated to overviewing Spanish literature. Um, he continued traveling throughout different parts of Europe until in the winter of 1819, he made his first, and I believe only, trip to Russia. This winter visit, uh, resulted in a firm and lasting friendship with a very well-connected, unfortunately also very benevolent, uh, Russo-German scholar called Friedrich von Adelow. Uh, von Adelow came from uh, a, a family of distinguished philologists. He was himself fascinated by languages and um, crucially for what followed, the influential von Adelow took Bowring under his wing introduced him to several Russian poets and supplied Bowring with a German crib for what would, be, what would become known as Bowring's translations of Russian poetry. Uh, the first edition of these entitled Specimens of the Russian Poets appeared at Bowring's own expense in 1821 to a really favorable uh, critical reception in England. Um, on the publication later that year, of the second edition of the first volume, um, the Emperor Alexander of Russia even sent um, Bowring what the latter referred to as a large amethyst ring surrounded with diamonds. It, it's a shame translators don't get that kind of um, attention these days. Um, in fact, the first volume of uh, Specimens of the Russian Poets was so favorably received that Bowring immediately began working on a second volume and it was completed in rather exciting circumstances in prison. During the intervening period he had of course continued his commercial travels and um, while in France in 1822 um, on perfectly respectable business he managed to get mistaken for a spy, a radical, a, a, a radical spy potentially smuggling secrets out of the country or in league against the French government. And as a result, he was clapped into prison in Boulogne for um, five, five weeks. He put this time to extremely good use, not only finishing the second volume of translations, um, but also writing a reasoned account of prison conditions on the continent, which stood him in good stead with his uh, new utilitarian friends, of which, of which more in a moment. Um, the second volume had a new and somewhat more politically critical introduction and uh, poems by Krylov, Zhukovsky and others had been added. It appeared in 1823 to continued claim. Bowring never produced any more Russian anthologies, but um, this, this, this pair of volumes would be succeeded over the next couple of decades by um, almost a dozen successive anthologies of poetry translated from different languages, including Dutch, Swedish, Czech, uh, what he called Serbian and Magyar, by which he meant Hungarian. And in fact, my opening quotation was taken from the introduction to his volume of Hungarian poems. In every case, Bowring did acquire some knowledge of both the grammar and the vocabulary of the language. We know this because he usually tries to teach his readers some of it in the, in the translator's introduction. Um, but his actual translations were usually derived, just like the Russian ones, from a crib made by somebody else, usually a native speaker, 
into a language with which Bowring was firmly familiar, like German or Spanish or even English. And then Bowring would go over these quibs and turn them into suitably poetic English. Uh, you'll see an example later on, and you can judge for yourselves how successful this approach to translation really is. And it was also around this time that Bowring met a fellow Unitarian, uh, um, the philosopher Jeremy Bentham, who was then in his 70s. Uh, the elderly Bentham described Bowring as, and I quote, one of the most extraordinary, if not the most extraordinary, um, men I ever saw, end quote. It was Bentham's patronage that caused Bowring to be appointed political editor of the fledgling Westminster Review in 1825. And on the death of his mentor in 1832, Bowring had the further honor, even if it was a rather extensive task, of editing Bentham's collected work. And although he was Bentham's literary executor, I do like to think that Bowring may also have been responsible for fulfilling the philosopher's famous testamentary direction to be embalmed and placed in the Museum of London University on Gower Street, fully dressed and with cane in hand. So Bowring's rising literary star was unfortunately dogged by a series of failures in his commercial and political life. His um, commercial enterprises, um, which in later life included a Welsh ironworks, tended to lose money. And perhaps this was at least partly because he did try to treat his workers fairly. His, his original business, uh, which he'd, he'd founded in the 1820s, went bankrupt within a decade. And from that period on, he relied primarily on government appointments for his income. And in 1831, fortunately after the repeal of the laws which would have made this impossible, he was nominated Britain's commercial commissioner to France. A Dutch university awarded him an honorary doctorate, so he used the title of doctor until he was knighted uh, in 1854. Um, he was given another government post as a civil servant responsible for scrutinizing government accounts in the mid-1830s. And in 1835, he was successfully elected as an MP for a Scottish borough. Um, he didn't hold that for very long, but during the 1840s, he stood again for the industrial town of Bolton, and held that seat despite um, the many disturbances of the period uh, for eight years. As a member of parliament, he was chiefly noted for his efforts to rationalize and decimalize the currency. Um, his introduction of the florin was a partial success for him. And at the end of the 1840s, he was dispatched to Canton in China as British consul. As still later, he became governor of Hong Kong. But this role, although he held it for five years, ended very bitterly in uh, rebellion, accusations of corruption, which were disproved, and a dramatic mass poisoning by arsenic, which um, very sadly led to the death of Baring's wife. So in 1860, after that rather dramatic and unfortunate conclusion to his uh, career as a civil servant, he limped home to Exeter, where he soon and apparently happily remarried. He continued to occupy a number of foreign diplomatic honors, and um, he was even appointed a diplomatic envoy um, for the Kingdom of Hawaii at the, at the very end of his life. And I'm going to try and show you some images from this period. So here you can see him. Um, this, is the first, um, this is the very first issue of the Westminster Review from 1824 in which Bowring published a review article about Russian literature. So this was a year after the publication of the second volume of his specimens, and he was considered quite the expert on Russian literature, a role he would glory in for the rest of his life. Now, as he does not include Pushkin in either of his anthologies, forgivably because Pushkin was still the new kid on the block at this stage, but he does mention Pushkin in this review article, and I believe it's considered the first mention of Pushkin in English um, in, in history. The caricature is not from the Westminster Review. I think it's from one of the London Gazettes, and it was by one of, one of Bowring's many detractors. They felt that he'd gotten his position through being annoyingly multilingual, if there is such a thing, fawning upon the elderly Bentham, 
and generally being a, a very irritating know-it-all and busybody. So you can see here he is sitting, reading, looking very self-satisfied with a bust of Bentham uh, positioned um, not very far away as if it's stirring the moment. I couldn't really resist including this topographical slide because as uh, Rafi mentioned at the beginning, I live really literally around the corner from um, where Borrowing was born. So the colorful image on the left of this slide uh, shows the, 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 the street on which uh, um, little Lock Bear, where Borrowing was born, and um, I want to call it big lock bear, lock, lock bear, but greater lock bear across the road were situated. You can't actually see little lock bear in the colorful image, but you can see greater lock bear. Um, neither survives today, sadly. In the um, middle of the slide, uh, top middle, you can see the site where little lock bear stood. It was a garage, now it's a housing estate. And at the in the bottom of the middle of the slide, this is what uh, Great Lock Bear uh, looked like in the, in the mid 19th century towards the end of uh, Bowering's life. Interestingly, and perhaps confusingly, because you'll find a lot of misinformation about this in, in um, Bowering biographies, I mentioned he was born in Little Lock Bear, but his family leased that property from the owners of Greater Lock Bear. The owners of Greater Lock Bear were the Bearing family who had already founded that bank which um, famously went on to be ruined in, I think, uh, 1995 in the, the great run on Baring's Bank. So um, the Baring family were tenants of the Baring's. On the right hand side of my slide at the top, you can see George's Meeting House, the local Unitarian chapel. Um, it's still in good condition today, but um, it is now a Wetherspoons. And um, at bottom right, um, you, see, um, you see Claremont, the house which uh, Baring bought on his retirement from Hong Kong and where he died. And it's also, it's really very close to where he grew up. It's, it's just beside the, the, the school my children attend, which um, gives me a nice sense of symmetry when I'm, when I'm doing my rounds about Exeter. And um, while we proceed down Baring memory lane, here you see um, uh, evidence of his um, survival in Hong Kong, um, Baring Street. Um, He's, the botanical gardens in Hong Kong were also founded by and named after him. And um, I couldn't resist including this slide, which um, shows the medals that he received uh, from the, the, the king of, of Hawaii for his achievement in, as you see, furthering socioeconomic ties between that um, little known island kingdom and the countries of Europe. And now I come to the next part of my talk. So I'm going to speak for about five minutes about Bowering's Russia and then five minutes about his poetry before wrapping up. I hope that's okay from a time perspective. So that 1819 visit to Russia took Bowering to St. Petersburg where he was struck by the contrast between what he called palaces and mansions of great splendor and solidity. And the fact that as he recorded in his memoirs, it was sometimes difficult to make one's way through the ordure found on large staircases and unswept courts. When he visited the Imperial Palace, he was struck by the splendor of the costumes people wore and the grandiosity of the halls, and not least, being who he was, by the multicultural and heteroclastic nature of the Empire citizens. He was really excited to attend a court ball, um, not because it was a court ball, but because it was attended by dozens of ethnicities from Mongolians and Finns to Armenians and Circassians. So Bowring's wish to share the fruits of Russian culture abroad did however imply at the same time a civilizing mission, which he justified on the basis of what he perceived as Russia's uncouth and indeed barbarian customs. He was particularly annoyed by the existence of slavery the passive character of the people and the nature of the autocratic state. He criticized what he referred to as the lack of gradations in Russian society. This lack of gradations allowed a gap to persist between what he called uncivilized and brutish peasants who were still li living in medieval conditions, the fetters of vassalage, and of course the nobility. Byring clarified that in Britain, and I quote, the spirit of information, wherever elicited, 
rapidly spreads over and glows in every link of the electric chain of society. But in Russia, however bright the flame, it is pent up, it cannot spread. Assuredly, the Russian nation can make no striking progress in civilization until the terrible barriers which so completely separate the different ranks are destroyed." Unquote. Um, he considered Tsar Alexander to be of a vacillating temperament and easily flattered. And um, he finished by lamenting the utter lack of an established middle class to unify and resolve the extremes of Russian society. I think he can be seen as attempting to apply a very British solution to a very Russian problem. But his criticisms were not unusual for that period. And indeed, they were echoed um, 30 years later by the anonymous author of an 1855 memoir called um, The English Woman in Russia. And the charming illustrations that you see on this slide are taken mostly from her memoir and also from another, another um, document dating also from the early 19th century, a visit by a certain John Cochrane who walked around much of Tsarist Russia and sketched what he saw. Um, this is um, an 1817 sketch map of Russia, mostly notable for being almost completely blank, but I have included it because it matches up very well chronologically with Bowering's visit in 1819. And um, I've, I'll come back to this slide if I have time. Uh, you'll notice that it's, it's based on a translation of a German story, uh, which Bowering undertook on the advice and with the aid of his good friend Friedrich von Adelung. And I've included it here mainly because it shows how very well networked Bowering was. And not only was he well connected abroad, at home in Britain, even if he annoyed people, he also knew the right people. The illustrator for this edition of um, von Chamiso's Peter Schlemel was George Cruikshank, who later illustrated Dickens' novels. So Bowering really was one of those people who knew a little bit about everything and um, knew almost everyone. And so finally, I come to um, the actual specimens of the Russian poets. And here you are seeing at the title page of the first edition of the first volume published in 1821. And it's, um, it's from the Debenham Exeter Institution, which was a private library in Exeter, which uh, Bowring went on to um, encourage and be on the committee of in his final decade of life when he returned to Exeter. Um, so what was contained in specimens of the Russian poets? Well, the book offers a very interesting survey of the pre-Pushkinian players in Russian poetry. Um, he praised, in his detailed introduction, he praised Lomonosov as the father of Russian poetry, uh, critiqued uh, Sumarokov as being primarily an imitator of La Fontaine. He singled out the comedies of von Wiesin, as he referred to von Wiesin, for praise, and he probably preferred Derjavin over all his contemporaries. And he also chose with, admir he also chose with really admirable breath to include um, some poets who are barely remembered today. So along with um, names like uh, Heraskov, Zhukovsky, Bogdanovich, and Kapnis, uh, Krylov, of course, um, there are less well-known writers like Kostrov, uh, Bobrov, Hennitsa, Dmitriev, and others who are really only known to um, experts in that period. Um, he liked, he admired Karanzin, but he did criticize Karanzin for imitating Lawrence Stern on the grounds that, and I quote, the peculiarities which characterize Stern are only tolerable because they are original, end quote. And um, what I most enjoyed about uh, looking at the specimens were the insights that Barring has added into the personalities of some of these poets. For example, of the well-known author of, um, of um, fables, um, poetic fables, Krylov, he wrote, Krylov holds an office in the Imperial Library in Petersburg. He is well known to the bon viveur of the English club. His heavy and unwieldy appearance is singularly contrasted with the shrewdness and grace of his writings. Of Karamzin, Bowering wrote, I found him an agreeable and intelligent man, but I remember nothing in his conversation that betokened a high order of intellect. It was his object 
to flatter the emperor. Ouch. Zhukovsky, at the time of writing, was, Byron tells us, engaged as a companion to the Grand Dukes, that is, the Tsar's um, eldest son, and was busy translating Gray and Goldsmith. Batushkov, whom Byron admired sufficiently to cite one of his verses as um, a frontispiece to both, both, to both volumes of his um, anthologies, gets off very lightly because he was in Italy um, when Bowering visited, and so they never met in person. Um, Bowering was fond of using explanatory footnotes to supply historical as well as linguistic details for his readers. In, in a note to Derjavin's um, very important poem, The Waterfall, of which I'll say more in a moment, he wrote, I have no sympathies with the poet in the admiration he expresses of the warlike character. I can see but few distinctions between the conqueror and the executioner. Barring's reservations about conquerors and indeed about the autocratic system of government in Russia were not quite as obvious um, when he decided to dedicate the second volume to Alexander, autocrat of all the Russias, thanking him for his gift of a ring as a flattering mark of approbation. So Bowring certainly knew how to flatter when it needed to be done, much as he might criticize others for doing it. And he used his brief dedication of the second volume to the Tsar to urge the latter to place, as Bowring put it, the purer and nobler triumphs of civilization and literature above the brightest jewel of your imperial crown. As, um, as a translator, and not only in the case of Russian poetry, Bowring erred on the side of literality. No one, he wrote in his introduction to the first volume, can be more alive than I am to the extreme difficulty of communicating to a foreign version the peculiar characters of the original. I mean only to be a, an honest, conscientious interpreter. Many of the charms of their compositions, meaning the poems, have probably escaped me. Their faults, I am afraid, are but too faithfully rendered. I have discovered many, but I dared not meddle with them. Baring was very much alive to the linguistic wealth of the Russian language, explaining to his readers that its vocabulary and its syntax were derived from Greek, Tatar, French, German, and English. And he helpfully, if somewhat unnecessarily, explained the Russian alphabet, especially its unfamiliar sibilants and gutturals, to his readers with the help of a chart. But now we come to the crucial question. Um, was he any good as a translator? And the consensus is that he was not. Um, the most favorable reviews of the time tended to proceed from reviewers who had no knowledge of the source language. Those near contemporaries and successors who did know the source language tended to call him at best facile and at worst grossly unfaithful. So given, given Bowring's respect for Derjavin, I have chosen to contrast um, the first stanza of his translation of the latter's 1794 poem, uh, Vodopad, The Waterfall, which is an ode mainly concerned with the 18th century statesman, Count Potemkin, um, with a much later version by two contemporary translators. And if there's a native Russian speaker in the audience who would like to unmute and volunteer to read the first stanza in Russian, that would be, that would be really kind. I can do this if you don't mind me that Please. Алмаз насыплется горам с высот четырьмя скалами. Жемчугу бездна из ребра кипит внизу, пьет вверх по граме. От брызгов синий холм стоит, до речи рев в лесу гремит. That's beautiful. That's, thank you very much, Anna. So I think we could all hear the wonderful music of the original and um, the complexity, uh, which reminds me of the, the many motes of light and water in a waterfall itself. This is a poem which is famed for its semantic complexity and its use of paradoxical imagery, both to convey its complex subjects, it's a very long poem, and um, also simply what it does, such as using the, creating the metaphor of a mountain that was something that rises up, made of something that is falling down like water. So it's full of paradoxes and it's full of complexity. 
And as you can see from Bowering's translation, which is the one in the middle, the mountain gets completely lost. Um, his labored English, and note that rather painful uh, rhetorical low in the first line, um, preserves the rhyme pattern while mutating the meter into a very typically English iambic pentameter. So we lose the music, we lose the rhythms and the patterns of the original, what we do get is a very ponderous Anglo-centric poem. Um, for, for contrast, I've included a much more recent translation from the Penguin Book of Russian Verse undertaken by Alexander Levitsky and Marta Kitchen. And um, again, it, it isn't perfect, no translation is perfect. And you may wish to point out that some things have disappeared um, from this translation as well. Uh, for example, we've lost the forest, which is mentioned in the last line. So something is always going to be lost in translation, that's a truism. But perhaps the problem with Baring's version is that quite a lot is added as well, and he does wander unnecessarily far from the original. Um, so in conclusion, if I, can, um, I think it's might be useful to look back to the introduction that Baring wrote to his um, second volume in 1823. And here he commented that his selection was meant, it, it, his selection consisted of nothing but an uninformed and infant poetical literature in Russia. He claimed that he was presenting the earliest gems, in his words, of Russian poetry. So his selection offered what he called fair hope and elements of improvement, but it was not to be viewed as definitive or complete in any way. And he ended his introduction by remarking that Russia, full as she is of the materials out of which great minds are formed, may yet perhaps take her stand in intellectual eminence among the nations of Europe at no distant period. Um, so we can see that he really was imposing his own views upon the, the state of Russian culture. And um, his apparently modern and open-minded commitment to bringing fresh garlands of poetry back to his translator's art, that lovely a metaphor with which I began this talk was in fact balanced by a really quite strongly judgmental and Anglo-centric view of other nations and their cultural achievements compared with, with, uh, with uh, those of England as, a, as the fundamental benchmark. And perhaps that use of the arc as a metaphor for the translator's task was revealing because it suggests the primacy of the arc itself here, the English nation acting as storehouse and arbiter of what gets to be kept over those foreign flowers and garlands which it encounters. Okay. Thank you all very much for listening. Thank you. Um, really, absolutely fascinating talk. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat at the moment, but please do. Uh, actually, you know what? We've got a raised hand here from Rebecca Beasley, so let's unmute a moment. Oh, is that just a clap? Okay. <laughs> well, um, I'm sure we'd all like to applaud as well. Um, please do, please do. I did have a question too, if, if um, Great. it's okay. Yeah. Please, yeah. Just a very simple one, really bouncing off what, um, where we got to at the end there, um, which is, do we know anything about uh, how his um, translations were received in Russia? That's a wonderful question, Rebe uh, Rebecca. Thank you very much. Um, do we know how? Well, what I don't know any more than what I've mentioned, which is that um, they were favorably received by Friedrich von Adelow, who was the person who facilitated his translations. And um, they maintained their correspondence over the first half of the 1820s. And um, uh, Baring sent von Adelow. Uh, various um, uh, various British philosophical treatises uh, for his reading pleasure. We also know, because of the gift of the ring, that Alexander felt very positively about the translations. But I don't. I doubt that they were widely circulated in Russia. And um, no, I I don't know any more about how the poets, for example, those who were aware they were being translated, like Krylov and Zhukovsky. I don't know how they felt about it. It would be um, a big point to follow up. And how, um, how widely circulated were they in Britain?
Do, do you know um, about sort of how popular they, they became in England? I'm sorry, Rafi, I only heard how popular they became. I could, I could. Sorry, yes, in, in Britain, um, I was going to ask um, how, how popular or influential they were um, I, English translating kind of tradition. I don't think they were very influential. I think they were superseded in the second half of the 19th century. And I actually, I don't think that there was much vogue for Russian poetry during the 19th century, although I'm prepared to stand corrected as there are people here who know mo much more about that than I do. Um, what I do know is that they were favorably reviewed at the time. So they were, he got positive attention from the, the London magazine and other contemporary reviews, but not so much positive attention that he went on doing it. So for example, he, as we know, he never went on to translate Pushkin. That, that would have been rather exciting. He moved on from Russian to other things because I think it was clear to him that he had reached peak Russian. So he chose to continue his career as a translator by working from other languages, including many Slavonic languages, um, rather than persevering with Russian. And that wasn't because of a lack of affection for the Russian, uh, for the Russian language or the Russian tradition. It was simply because I think he realized there was no longer a market. Okay, that slightly answers the, the question that's just come in why, as to why Pushkin's poems weren't included in the second volume of his works. I suppose, I, he, yeah, had, had kind of slightly um, gone from there. He doesn't seem to have been aware of Pushkin at all in 1821. I think at that point, Pushkin was, Pushkin would have been in exile in the Crimea, I think, at the time when Baring was physically in Russia, but they wouldn't have met. Possibly Pushkin was spoken of dismissively by the people uh, with whom Baring would have associated. I haven't seen any correspondence, so I don't know whether von Adelung, who, who was his major informant, his connection with Russian society, um, wrote to him about Pushkin. Um, he's, his sort of um, political leanings in sort of um, in the light of his translations um, and his attitudes towards foreign cultures seem um, slightly Whiggish in the sense that he he definitely has this idea of a kind of uh, forward march of culture and uh, culture kind of reaching a, a higher state in, in Britain, for example, and other cultures needing to be raised up to that level. Um, do you think that's uh, was a sort of um, influential um, philosophy at the time and and do you know if that kind of carried on within the, the translation of, of Russian works or any other works into English? Well Rafi that's an impressively the far-reaching question and it goes far beyond my, my area of expertise. Um, I think there are others who could answer that better than me, so I would invite anyone, anyone else who, who might wish to comment on that to go ahead. Um, so um, yes, he was Whiggish in his leanings. Um, that attitude you've just described certainly characterized his whole political career. How influential it was in later translations, well, I do believe that, um, I, I think what you're asking is weren't 19th century uh, translations driven by a desire to make the world more enlightened uh, rather than to, to publicize a particular author of whom one is fond. Uh, yes, I would say that was a very um, persevering strand in the history of translation. You only have to look at um, the Tolstoy's contacts with the Quakers, for example, the role of the Mauds in, um, in propagating his work and also the role of the various free thinkers and 20th century dissenters and conscientious objectors who continued to translate Tolstoy's nonfiction in the um, in the early 20th century. So that's certainly a very strong, persistent strand. Bowering's case is interesting because he was both um, um, a, a self-consciously enlightened translator, bringing the garlands back to his art, but he was also a politician um, with certain powers. And his um, his ideas about universal enlightenment sadly only got him into a great deal of trouble when he was governor of Hong Kong because he got mixed up in the opium war, his attempts to be fair to the local citizens 
um, eventually led to a rebellion and, as I mentioned, the disaster when leading, leading very quickly to um, loss of British influence in the region, um, let alone the damage to Bowring's immediate family and to his reputation. So his own life was a test case of the effectiveness of well-meaning principles. But yes, he was a lifelong Bentham, Benthamite and utilitarian who did believe in maximizing human happiness. Now, I'm sorry for rabbiting on. I can see, um, I can see more questions uh, popping up. Um, Mr. Marina Burrow, um, I, don't, I don't think I have any examples of the translations of Queen Love's Fables, but I agree that those would be absolutely fascinating. Um, when, if you keep in touch with me, when libraries reopen, I might be able to send you something. Um, hopefully without violating any, any copyright regulations. Um, Mavis Pilbeam's question, how widely was English spoken and read at that time in Russia? I, that's beyond my competence, I'm sorry. Um, and um, and um, I'm just reading the interesting uh, comment from Hugh Barnes. Yes, um, I, I wasn't aware of the 1821 translation, which is fascinating. And that, that's correct about the second volume being dedicated to Alexander from, from the prison, a very dramatic detail. There's a slightly gnomic comment from Simon Franklin. It just says a question. Yeah, thank you. Hello, Simon. Um, good to see you. Hi, Aaron. Good to see you. Um, I'm just holding here a copy of Bowering. Um, I, you're, yeah. Can I just thought. ask which, which um, volume have you got and which edition? Uh, this is the first edition of the first volume. This is both volumes of the second edition. I see. Excellent. But I think that... Um, yeah, as a quality of translator, I wonder whether, I mean, in order to, to comment on that, I wonder whether one wouldn't have to look at assumptions about translating in the 1820s, um, because I suspect that, that that he was very much in tune with what translating was supposed to be in the day, and I wouldn't want to criticise him too much for that, um, particularly because of his extraordinary innovation in producing Heavens, two volumes. As mm -hmm. to his popularity and influence in England, I mean, the fact that there was a second edition very quickly matters, but also there was an American edition in 1822 um, to, to, to cross the Atlantic so quickly, it was extraordinary. Yes, um, that is astonishing. He's also, I mean, just a few years later was the first English language grammar of the Russian language by James Hurd. And the exercise at the back of that, he quotes, he uses Bowring as the kind of just surname Bowring translated by Bowring, the assume, assuming mm. that people knew that Bowring was the translator of things. Um, so I think there is a resonance at the time quite extraordinarily. It was possibly limited to some extent to the 1820s, but um, one shouldn't telescope excessively that period of time. He had a significant um, resonance in his generation. Um, I had a, sorry, that's a comment, not a question. I had a question, <laughs> which is, um, how did he, was he dependent on his informant for the choice of poets? How did he, um, how, how did, because it's, it's an interesting selection um, was it his selection or was it the selection given to him? How was he told what the canon was? So, um, just to respond first of all to your comment, um, I'm not, you, the information that I have is that um, the, um, his, his books were reprinted, selections from his Russian volumes were reprinted in 1823 in a volume called American First Class Book in Reading and Recitation, which was used in the public schools of Boston. And that, that really is an astonishing coup, as you say, to get them um, so much attention and to cross the Atlantic so fast. Um, and you're absolutely right about how we shouldn't, we shouldn't be too critical and we, we shouldn't telescope his achievements. Um, and deliberately being critical because um, as I was writing this, um, as I was preparing this paper, I did have the unusual experience of having Bowring uh, literally watching me because I was writing uh, on a, at a table which was beside his bust in the Devon and Exeter institution. And it's, um, it's very unnerving to, to write about um, a subject who is, who is watching you. So perhaps I've um, deliberately tried to be as objective and critical as possible. Um, but um, of course, I, I agree that his, um, his um, achievements were, were astonishing. 
Another factor, I think, is that most of the um, reviews of him that we read today, the, most of the articles about him were written in the mid 20th century, with a few honorable exceptions, um, by academics. And academics, I'm speaking very generally here, uh, do tend to hate amateurs. And Baring was a brilliant amateur. So I think many of the academics who wrote about him have just taken the opportunity to really cudgel him for um, knowing a little bit about a lot of things. Can, can I just add one small footnote in terms yes. of influence? The volume that I'm holding here of yes. the first edition has a book plate in it. It was owned by Anthony Trollope. Anthony oh. Trollope? Oh my goodness. It was goodness. owned by Anthony Trollope. So this is someone who spoke to writers. Um, that, that, that's fascinating detail. Your actual question, would you remind, would you mind reminding sorry, me? Sorry, I'm sorry, I'm monopolizing. The question was, was how did he select? Ah, that I don't know, but I believe he was strongly influenced by von Adelung. Mm -hmm. I'd like to say that he met with a, a number of the poets and, um, but I think he, I think he translated what he was advised to translate. So mm -hmm. possibly the question of why there was no Pushkin uh, comes back a particular Russo-German family. Maybe they had a maybe they had a prejudice against Pushkin. Um, that slightly answers the question that's just come in from Susan Reynolds. Did uh, Baring seek any advice from Russian sources about the poets to select, as he did in the uh, Cheskin anthology? Um, yes, uh, he. That, that's correct. As far as I know, he had one Russian source, and that was Friedrich von Adelung. And as I mentioned already, they kept in touch for years afterwards. And um, yeah, I don't I don't know much about the Czech connection, but there is there was an article I consulted which went into a, a lot of detail about it. He does seem to have had one contact in every country, and um, the contacts weren't always completely happy with him afterwards. There was an issue as as Susan's question flags up with his Czech assistant or his Czech assistant is the wrong word, but. Um, also, there was a problem with the Polish um, um, uh, anthology that he brought out. Um, he seems to have maintained the best relationship, really, with his with with the Russian contact. It's it's fascinating that he was a translator of so many languages as well. I mean, it's it's not very common. I mean, was that more common uh, at the time that he was writing um, when when you would have um, these sort of uh, Benjamin Franklin-esque polymaths uh, doing all kinds of things. Was that, was that more of a, an accepted uh, sort of career? I, I, I don't know, I have to plead ignorance. I do think that he was very unusual in his circle and um, various of his friends um, commented, well, I, I use the word friends, many of his acquaintances um, left comments about how irritating they found him because he spoke in so many different languages, often in the course of a single house party. Um, being monolingual themselves, for the most part, many of his um, English friends considered this to be objectionable showing off. And um, so I think he was certainly unusual among his own, um, his, his own um, social group. Right. And, um, if if Barry Straluk is still there, thank you for that comment. That is interesting. Yeah. Uh, Traces um, and Byron's uh, Don, Ju Don Juan. Yeah. Um, thank you, Boris, for, for for your question and for joining us tonight. Um, it's we've had a very good uh, turnout this evening. I'm really very pleased that the 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 number and the caliber of our of our guests. So thank you all. Um, Let's see if we have any last, a few last questions. Um, do I have any more written down? Um, uh, thank you, Bill, for your kind comment. I, I'd just like to add that my main qualification for speaking about um, Sir John Bowring is um, being, his, um, being his neighbor through time. Um, this is not my field of expertise. So many of you have exposed my ignorance here. Um, I, I know very little about this period, but I do think he's a fascinating figure who deserves to be who deserves to be much better known. And his achievement, even if his even if his um, translations were clumsy, even if they left out a great deal, it was still a, a truly remarkable achievement. Uh, so we've got a hand up from from Heather here. Let's let's see if we can uh, get a question. Mm -hmm. 
Perhaps it's just a disembodied hand. <laughs> and that'll press the wrong button. Sorry about oh. that. <laughs> no worries. Um, I I don't have any more questions, but um, and it looks like everybody's thanking you. Um, so I'll add my thanks. Um, yeah. Thank you Hi. very much for, for the talk. It was absolutely. I mean, I had no idea. I I, I don't think I'd I'd heard the name, but I'd never known anything about him or or what his uh, sort of life was like. So it was a, a real pleasure to have this one starting off our, our series of six, um, six talks with the Anglo-Russian Research Network. Um, I'd recommend everybody to check out the next five. Um, let me see if I can um, give you the, the subjects of the next ones. I know that the next one is going to be um, from Anna Masanova, and it is about, uh, I guess, Marion Fell, another sort of um, character of, uh, of, the of the Russian translation world. Um, and that'll be next Friday. Um, so I'll say thank you very much again, uh, Miran, and thank you to everybody who's uh, joined us. We we've had a really um, fascinating talk and really interesting questions afterwards. So um, really uh, a great event all around, I think. Um, so I'll, um, I'll see you hopefully next day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all very much. Bye. Thank you.